Hello, my name is Ellie Gold. I'm the president of the Gold Institute for International Strategy here in Washington, D.C. We are a uh, national security uh, foreign policy based think tank, and we focus on issues that uh, pertain to the security of uh, this country. Uh, as we've just we just experienced uh, the elections in uh, on Tuesday. This is November of 2021, and the elections on Tuesday in Virginia, in New Jersey, and uh, in in the individual elections throughout the country. Uh, there was a huge shift, uh, as we as we've seen, um, and. And it's one that gets people to really pay attention, especially as we've used these elections as a bellwether uh, towards the 2022 midterm elections. Uh, joining me uh, today is somebody who I've known for, for probably about uh, six, seven years now, uh, a, a good friend, uh, uh, spent three, three terms in Congress uh, representing his district in Pennsylvania, Keith Rothfuss. Keith, uh, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Ellie. How are you today? I am well. I am well. I'm trying to make heads or tails of what happened on Tuesday. I mean, these are all good things in my opinion, but uh, it's just very, very interesting. So, you know, we're going to talk and the, the, the topic of our conversation to, today really is how to fix the House of Representatives. In fact, you wrote a paper, about a five or six thousand word paper on this very topic, and it's, I found it to be fascinating. But before we get into that, what are your thoughts that happened on Tuesday? I mean, we saw we, we saw Virginia, we saw New Jersey, New Jersey, who, who people weren't paying attention to. We saw uh, uh, in Buffalo, New York, and Seattle, and Minnesota, and Minneapolis. What, what say you? Uh, you know, we also had something going on in Pennsylvania. Uh, we had a couple of statewide, several statewide races for some of our judicial uh, offices. We, for example, we had the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. One of the justices had to retire because it's a mandatory retirement age. Uh, the court had been broken down by a partisan basis of five Democrats, two Republicans. Uh, that flipped several years ago, which led to the uh, redistricting decision that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court came up with. Uh, by the liberals on the court several years ago that were responsible for knocking me out of office. Uh, in any event, the the Republican won the, the vacant seat that was opened up, as well as Republicans won the other statewide offices for the lower level of appellate courts. So that was a good night for, for Republicans in Pennsylvania. And we saw also across the Commonwealth, uh, some of the municipal races uh, going for the Republicans. So it just wasn't New Jersey, Virginia, uh, other areas. Uh, people are paying attention. They're activated. They're not happy with what they're seeing in Washington, D.C. with, uh, frankly, a lot of, uh, there's a vacuum of leadership right now. And uh, what's trying to fill that vacuum is a hard leftward push, uh, which the American people do not appreciate. It was interesting. I was reading an article in the Washington Post uh, Representative Sean Maloney from New York seemed to be saying that we just we need to get our policies in place. We have to we have to put policies in that the American people will feel uh, in their families. You know, well, the fact is the American people and their families are feeling the policies of this administration, this hijacked liberal Congress right now. Every time you go to the gasoline station, you're feeling it. Every time you go to the grocery store, uh, if your products in stock. Yeah, the price is going to be a lot higher. They're talking about record high price for Thanksgiving dinner, for crying out loud. We are feeling the impact of the policies of this administration and this liberal Congress, and the American people don't like it. Now, it's interesting that, that, that uh, Terry McAuliffe in, in, in uh, uh, Virginia, he ran, uh, he ran on a Biden uh, platform. In fact, he had uh, Joe Biden come to, to his state. He had Kamala Harris come to the state. He had Barack Obama come to the state. Glenn Youngkin um, ran on his own platform. Uh, I do believe that he did have Donald Trump's endorsement, but he did not have Donald Trump come to, uh, to his state to speak for him. Uh, he did not have any, uh, any of that caliber celebrity to the state, to the best of my knowledge. I, I could be wrong, but to the best of my knowledge, he did not. Um, are people now paying attention to the issues rather than the uh, rather than the the person? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I always t uh, talk about uh, personalities and policy. Uh, and depending on the time, people are going to be focusing on, on one or the other, perhaps both. Uh, you mentioned Vice President Harris coming into Virginia. <laughs> she did say that what happens in Virginia sets the stage for what happens in 2022, 2024, and beyond. So I think people heard that and they said, you know what, you're right. We are going to set the stage for 2022. So I think you have a lot of Democrats who are very concerned about the direction of things. You, you heard some of the pundits yesterday talking about the party uh, now being out of touch with where the American people are at. Uh, this is what happens when you try to uh, govern a, a country that's split down the middle as though they thought they had a 70% mandate. They don't. Uh, uh, you look at these massive spending bills they're, they're trying to put through. And again, that goes right through to inflation. Um, so, so yeah, I think you're right. People are focused on policies. You, you had the, the situation with what erupted in Loudoun County, Virginia, with the school board, uh, the, both the critical race theory, uh, the issue with respect to transgender uh, students, uh, the, the, the assault that happened in one of the high schools that they covered up, that they, they weren't being honest with the, with the people of Loudoun County, with the, 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 the parents who are sending their children to these schools. Uh, parents have a right to, to know what's going on in the schools. They have a right to contribute with respect to what's going on in the schools. They don't have... Uh, there should not be a threat that the attorney general, that President Biden's attorney general is going to start investigate parents who express concerns about what's going on at these schools. Uh, this is the overreach that you're seeing from the hard left uh, uh, in, in, in so many different areas. You, you see it even in the capital markets. I was on financial services com uh, the committee. You're seeing the, the agencies of President Biden uh, through, through such... Uh, um, mild sounding terms as ESG, environmental social governance, uh, uh, a, a threat to the proper allocation of capital in this country, where you're going to have the government picking the winners and the losers. The Department of Labor just put out a new proposed regulation that's going to you know, really affect people's pension plans. They're for, uh, uh, what what companies are going to be investing in. Uh, these are things that should be determined by the free market, not by dictates from Washington, D.C. And so, I, again, I think that people are very concerned with the direction of, of this radical government that we have right now, and they want it stopped. You know, it's, it's very interesting. Um, you say that uh, uh, it, it, it's going to be, if you take a look at what happened in this election, which is something that, that I've never seen before. I mean, maybe you know on the in the local news it's happened but you have you have national cable news uh that, that are reporting on on school board members in in in, in various different uh districts you have you have they're talking about uh, about uh, uh, an item that was uh, an election uh in minneapolis or in seattle or and so, so no, these are things that these are things that never happened before. And and quite frankly, we had we saw in New Jersey the state the the uh, the state Senate president uh, lost to a uh, to a truck driver uh, who uh, spent five thousand dollars on his camp in, in campaign in total. It was his his opening video was was uh, was uh, uh, filmed by his uh, friend's nephew with an iPhone. I mean, it's, it's kudos remarkable. to iPhones. Uh, but 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 this is I mean this is truly amazing truly an amazing time but you know let's 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 switch yeah. here for a moment because because this is this is something that that, that I've noticed uh, this morning I saw on on a, a, an interview uh, congressman a Democrat congressman Matt Cartwright was talking about some policies with regards to uh, the pandemic exiting the pandemic and his comment was. Well, we're going to figure it out. Nothing's nothing's perfect. You know, we didn't go to school to learn how to exit a pandemic, which is absolutely true. Uh, the, however, however, I will say that what what he seemed to miss, and I and and this was in reference to something to do with education. What he referenced, what he failed to miss, was what happened on Tuesday. And what happened on Tuesday was the parents parent body the citizens of this country do no longer want somebody in a far off city yeah. making setting the rules for them which they have no input whatsoever 
I mean, this, that, that's classic. You know, you know, you know Representative Carver can say that, but you know, Governor DeSantis didn't go to school to figure out how to get out of a pandemic either. Yet he understood the common sense of the, of the people of Florida. He also understood data and he understood the science. For example, on masking, he talked to professionals. It's interesting because I remember seeing a, a report uh, uh, where they're talking to uh, an epi epidemiologist uh, um, who understands the, the nature of diseases, explaining that DeSantis you know, knows the data better than a lot of the doctors do. Uh, this is the precision with which he approached uh, uh, managing the pandemic and understanding the importance of a thriving economy and people, people being able to earn their livelihoods and the importance of young children to stay in school. When you're in first grade or second year grade, those are critical years for students. And to just say, you know what, you're going to stay home for a year. Well, well, you know, that might work if if you have uh, parents who, who are going to be able to be there, be engaged, who have the resources that can actually supplement or or, or take uh, in school. There are a lot of families who don't have that. So so the, the, the putting kids behind like that, because, you know, people on the left, they trust they trusted government as opposed to trusting the people and their common sense. And, and, and this is where the divide is. You have these elites who think that they can manage everything. That's what they go to the, go to the Kennedy School of Government for because they're gonna be the experts. But this is what Ronald Reagan talked about in the 1980s. Look, we can govern ourselves. And, and so we need to continue to, to rely on the goodwill and good faith of the American people. No, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is this is very, very interesting. Uh, you know, the big question, of course, now is: Did Glenn Youngkin give Republicans the blueprint with which to win twenty twenty two? And you know, the you know, the truth is, I believe he did. But uh, as I'm thinking about this for a moment, and as I'm thinking about why did we win on uh, uh, this past, why did the Republicans win this past? Uh, 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 Tuesday, and that is because the c citizens of this country are now really getting an understanding of government overreach. But it's this isn't this isn't government overreach. I mean, government overreach was like was was four eight years ago. I mean, this is so far beyond government overreach that without a doubt, you know. The, the constitution of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this great country, our founders created a document which is, which is really very easy to understand. But as time goes by, it's been you know, you know, 200 plus years, as time goes by, you know, technology changes, issues change, and that's why we have a Supreme Court that is there to, 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 uh, to, to identify or to study the issues and interpret the Constitution. But it appears to me that most members of Congress don't really understand that. Now, you, you, as I said before, you served three terms in the House of Representatives. You were there under two, uh, under two uh, speakers. Now, by the way, to, to, keep, to keep this an unbiased conversation, both speakers, which I know you're going to comment on, were Republicans, the same party that you belong to. So this isn't a Republican beating up on Democrats. You wrote this, you wrote this, uh, this paper, How to Fix the House of Representatives. We yeah. need to know that before we, before we support any candidates. Before anybody, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, by the way, we're, you know, we don't pick sides here at the Gold Institute. Um, tell me, tell us, what do we need to know yeah. in order to fix the House of Representatives and to bring people who can fix the House of Represent Representatives? You know, when people vote for their uh, representative in Congress, they expect that member to be able to go in and int introduce legislation, make arguments for that legislation, and get it, it to the best they're able, get it passed on the floor. I, uh, I was, that's what I did. Uh, some of my legislation was included with other 
bigger bills that got passed into law. I'm pro very proud of that. Uh, another uh, piece of legislation I had, you know, actually passed the House, did not pass the Senate, but the Environmental Protection Agency actually looked at the legislation and adopted it as a regulation or a rule that actually served to, to help keep some power plants open here in Pennsylvania, keep people working, and actually keep on cleaning up the environment because there, there are these power plants in Pennsylvania that are cleaning up tons, millions of tons of, of, of coal that was abandoned decades ago uh, by, by the steel industry. But but those plants are actually providing an environmental benefit and cleaning up streams, cleaning up hillsides and preventing spontaneous combustion. Be that as it may, uh, uh, you, you know, today, representatives in Congress aren't passing legislation. What happens? You have a handful of members, senior members, who will package uh, you know, bills in the thousands of pages uh, behind, that's happening this week. Nancy Pelosi just put out another iteration of this massive bill that the the, the Rules Committee, which is a, a committee in the House that determines the, what the terms of, deba of debate for a piece of legislation will, they, they get this. It, it hasn't even been circulated, and yet they're debating on the Rules Committee how this is going to be debated on the floor. Not a single member had even seen that uh, uh, legislation, save for a couple in the inner circle, save for a couple in the inner circle, and then you're expected to vote on it in 24 hours, 36 hours, whatever. This happened happens all too routinely. It happened when I was there with some of these massive uh, omnibus spending bills. You get 36 hours, maybe to look at 2,000 pages that's going to spend a trillion dollars. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, there needs to be a much more iterative process going on, time for debate, time for amendments. They've completely shut down the amendment process. You know, the amendment process is the opportunity for a single member to get on the floor and try to convince 217 of their colleagues to vote for something and then have influence on a piece of legislation. Uh, that doesn't happen. Instead, we package these, these massive bills together you're expected to vote the party line, even th whether or not that represents the interest of your district. And when you have these massive bills that you can have 100 reasons to vote for and 100 reasons to vote against and a lot of bad stuff comes in, you lose the ability to hold people accountable. Um, and, and so if you want this place to work, you have to give Congress time to, to really get into the debate on things, open it up, give time for amendments. You're going to have to spend a little bit more time there. But this is... You know, in the context of what's happened with that institution over the last hundred years, as Congress gave up more and more of its power to the executive branch agencies, or on the other hand, the Supreme Court would come in and, and invade the province of Congress by taking a law and rewriting it. The job of rewriting law belongs in Congress. It doesn't belong at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court needs to have some humility and say, you know what, there's a problem with this legislation but it's up to Congress to fix it. It's not up to the Supreme Court to fill in the gaps. Uh, uh, so we again- saw the Supreme Court, Phil, We saw the Supreme Court step in on that, with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with the, with the Obamacare. Well, exactly. Uh, but when you had the Obamacare bill was passed uh, and the argument was made that the individual mandate was a, uh, uh, and the IRS penalty on top of that, was a penalty and not a tax. They, they emphatically said it is not a tax because they didn't want to be held accountable for raising a tax. And so then Justice Roberts comes in with the greatest bait and switch in jurisprudential history and says, oh, wait a minute, it's not a penalty, it is a tax. So we're going to uphold it. And, and he absolved Congress <laughs> for responsibility for hiking a tax because they said it wasn't a tax, but then he said, oh, don't worry, it was, and we'll save the bill. He should have kicked it back to the Congress and said, you know what? Uh, uh, it's a penalty, unconstitutional under the Commerce Clause, therefore it's up to you, Congress, to fix it, rather than tr allowing Congress to, go to get away with what it did. And, and so I have a number of reform proposals in this document you're referring to that was published in National Affairs, which is a publication of the, of the American Enterprise Institute, which lays out some of the issues that are happening in Congress uh, and, and how to go back and fix it. And some of the ideas I think it might be counterintuitive for a conservative like me to propose. One of them, for example, I, I think you actually need to increase the size of the House of Representatives to reflect the, 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 the diversity of this country that has happened since in the last hundred years. Uh, the number 435, that's how many people we have in the House of Representatives. If you'd represented a district back in 1911 when that number was set, you would have represented 200,000 people. Today, the districts are about 750,000 people. Uh, so we've lost a diversity of thought. Uh, uh, this is the voice of the American people. 
Um, you want that voice to be heard. And if you had more people contributing more voices, and importantly, let them legislate, let them debate, let them make amendments. Uh, don't, don't put out a massive bill 36 hours before you expect people to vote on it. And and and, and now with uh, what they call uh, this absentee voting, where you can have a, a uh, fellow member vote for you by proxy on the floor, this is terrible. This is not the way the what the founders intended for what's supposed to be the greatest deliberative body in the world. Well, you know, you you make a very good point there. Uh, we saw that with we saw that with Obamacare. Uh, Nancy Pelosi had um, had, and this is a Democrat uh, Democrat uh, President Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi uh, uh, came in and and said, in order to pass, uh, we need to pass Obamacare to find out what's in it. Um, fast forward. Um, I had a conversation, you know, you know I focus on, on, on defense matters. Uh, I had a conversation with, with, with an ambassador for an Ar an, uh, from an Arab country. Um, you know, we were talking about MESA, the Middle East uh, Strategic Alliance. Um, and this was an idea where they can put together a, a group of countries in a, in a, uh, in, in a, a NATO-esque style organization. I mean, it's not NATO. It doesn't have Article 5 it's a conversation for a different time. Um, and he said he said he was at a meeting at the State Department and he said, OK, great. We like it. But tell us what is our role in it? And his he said to me in frustration, and this is obviously during a, 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 a Republican administration, he said to me, well, we were told to sign on to it and then we'll figure out what all the participants uh, roles will play. And he said, no, we're not doing it. So, so you make some very, very good points. Um, you know, this, this idea that we have such a, uh, you know, these enormous pieces of legislation um, and no one has actually any time to read it, um, it is a very good point that needs to be fixed. Um, it, we have only a few minutes left. Um, give me, I mean, I'm going to, I'll share a link to this article, I think, or this paper, I think everybody must read it. It's, it's an absolute must read before 2022, before you go to the, before you send in your first uh, candidate contribution. Um, but tell us, tell us, give us, give us that, that you know, that, that five-step process. What is it? Step number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Well, number one step's already been taken. People are engaged. It's so important. People are, they've tuned in. Uh, uh, they haven't tuned out. They've absolutely tuned in. They, they've seen the wreckage that's happening from the local school board. Uh, this whole critical race theory that is built on a lie, the 1619 uh, project, you know, arguing that we're fundamentally racist country. Uh, uh, people know intuitively that's that that's not right. And actually, you it, we got to go back to Lincoln. Uh, um, Lincoln had these debates in the 1850s. He talked about the, the importance of the Declaration of Independence. That's what this county, uh, this country was founded on. Uh, you go into that declaration, you understand the, the, the construct that the founders recognized of what government should be, where the government should be defending individual rights that happen to not come from the state, but come from God. President Kennedy talked about that in his inaugural address. Martin Luther King talked about this in the letter from the Birmingham jail. You know, they were talking about the importance of the foundational principles of this country that have been under sustained attack by the left wing, uh, by the progressive left wing for decades. The idea of God given equality. Our equality comes because we're made in the image and likeness of God, the, the human person is. Uh, we're endowed with, with rights, like the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to pursue happiness. These are foundational principles recognized in our Declaration of Independence, as is the whole notion of sovereignty in the people, which was a, a totally revolutionary concept in 1776, that the ultimate authority for a government is in the people, it's in us. So it's up to us to hire people, to vote for people, 
who understand that 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 jurisprudential framework and understand that the power rests in the people subject to the limitation that there are god-given rights that we can't trample on the right to speak the right to 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 free exercise of religion the right to keep and bear arms the right to have a trial by a jury in case somebody is going to accuse you of something the right to have counsel uh, um the, these are rights that are, are just fundamental to, to, to the western uh uh um, model that we have developed over centuries. This goes back to, to, it goes back to Jerusalem, it goes back to the Decalogue, it goes to Athens, it goes to Rome, it goes to, this is 2,000, more than 2,000 years of development. And in the fullness of time, in a sense, in 1776, a group of folks understood that uh, what the construct should be. And even at the same time, you, 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 then you get to the, to the Constitution uh, um, and the existence of slavery they sowed the seeds for the destruction of slavery and it took another 70 80 90 years to achieve that and three a, a civil war three constitutional amendments in uh, another 100 years after that to get, to get to the civil rights acts of 19 uh, of 1964 the voting rights act of 1965 uh, um but but it's all tied to what was in the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln talked about that. King talked about that. It's what we need to go back to. And so when you're looking at candidates running for office, how committed are they are they to those principles? Challenge them, test them. Do you understand the concept of, of this country and what it was founded on? It's a the, the whole critical race theory is built on a big lie that people understand that. As Governor DeSantis says, we should not have our schools teaching students to hate each other and to hate this country. Uh, we're so much better than that. People intuitively know that. Uh, uh, and so you have to be out there talking about the importance of these principles and then how they translate to what's going on in Washington DC. If the sovereignty is in the people, that shifts the power away from Washington to micromanage every single aspect of our lives back to our communities. That's what we need to be doing. Uh, we have we have about three and a half minutes left. So let me ask you one uh, question here, and uh, I'll give you the last three and a half minutes or three minutes. You know, a, a colleague of mine, a former colleague of mine, once said to me that uh, you know the problem with Washington is it's always a cesspool, but until you get here, and then it turns into a hot tub. Now the the. I, I never found the hot tub, guys. <laughs> I'm uh, sure that's why I'm talking to you. I never today. found it. <laughs> that's why I'm talking to you today. Although so, on my morning jogs, you could actually smell the cesspool <laughs> running down the mall. That, that's that's also true. You know, my office is on Capitol Hill, so I didn't know what you mean. Um, the 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 question here is, um, you know, we've already spoken a little bit about it, um, and that is these enormous uh, monstrosities of bills. The idea that you can have one person, which is, and that's why the Democrats are able to push things through. It's understood that Nancy Pelosi, before she walks into, before she wakes up in the morning, she has all of the votes. So that's why she's able to ram certain, those pieces of legislation through. Republicans work a little bit, a little bit differently. Although, although if I understand your thoughts correctly, Paul Ryan and John Boehner were somewhat uh, similar in that. But they understood. But but they understand that they no, have. No, to I'm, no, 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 no. Let me understand. Okay, right. Nancy Pelosi has. She's destroyed uh, uh, any semblance of what was in that institution. Uh, um, yeah, you know, we had our disagreements from time to time with the speakers uh, uh, that, that we served under, but it, 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 things were not being rammed down the way this speaker is. Things were not shut down. Uh, um, but both Speaker Boehner and Speaker Ryan understood the diversity within the conference, and, and they would scramble to somehow put together uh, uh, the, the numbers they needed to piece to pass the legislation. And if you disagreed, I mean, one of the touchstones, they, and I remember when I went in there, said, just no surprises. No, you know, if you can't do something because you, un, just let us know. And, and there was this, you know, iterative give and take, and it was frustrating. Uh, you know, Speaker Boehner talked about tr trying to herd cats. Uh, um, so yeah. I, I, yes, I stand corrected. I, 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 was, I did not mean that Boehner and Ryan, speakers, Boehner and Ryan were equivalent to Nancy Pelosi. I was saying on some, maybe on some level, 
there was it, it wasn't as you might have liked to see. Well, well, saying- the amendment process is a great example because again there, there was a a concern that if you opened up to hit all these amendments, well, and the Democrats did do this, they would put a poison pill amendment in that would you you know pass and that would make it unacceptable for for many of the Republicans and so the, the bill would never pass. Uh, but the, the answer to that, frankly, is to try, try again. And, right. and the answer to that, and I mentioned this in the, in, the, in, in, in the article I wrote, you know, allow a more robust amendment process where somebody puts up a poison pill amendment, well, then let's move to have an amendment to amend the amendment so that your amendment is going to uh, uh, um, make the amendment that they wanted to do unacceptable to them. Uh, and so right. you, you kind of neutralize it by this iterative give and take. But you know what that takes is more time. And so <laughs> the, the, right. the, the, the majority leader will set the, the amount of time and they will. And, and one of the problems is you fly in on Monday, you fly out on Thursday. And so everything is very much condensed. They don't give you the time to have these kinds of robust iterative debates um, that we should have. And so I have proposals in this paper about a way to, to re- really shake up that legislative process, let it become more organic, let it become more iterative, because that's going to reflect the diversity of the American people. So so real quick, and, and besides that, what we just discussed, which is, which is a huge issue, is there anything else uh, that, that, that people need to know about? Are there any other issues that really, you know, before we can do anything, we, these are, this is what we need to fix? Um, We've already discussed the size of the legislation. We've already discussed, you know, the the power of the speaker. Is there anything in particular that that really needs to be fixed or those two are big enough? Let's focus on those and then we can work on the rest later. I I, I think if you allow people to speak more, because again, what's happened is when when you when you shut down the iterative legislative process, what happens? People go to Twitter, they go to the, the cable shows. Um, and, and, and that's where the debate happens. It's not happening inside the House of Representatives where it should be happening with the opportunity to, to move for amendments. Um, and, and then you can start to address some of the such significant issues we have. We are in uncharted territory from an economic perspective right now with what has happened over the last uh, two years. I mean, we, we, we were going to we did not have a good fiscal situation before the pandemic hit. We had structural deficits of a trillion dollars. That was not sustainable then. But right. since that time, we've had another five, six trillion added to the national debt. And then you have these massive bills that they're pushing right now, which doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, we've got to get our fiscal house in order. But if you allow the house to actually have some more deli- deliberative debates, uh, let let people challenge some of the premises. And of course, one of the issues that we're dealing with now is big tech and how they've been choking off debate. Big tech picking winners and losers, shadow banning people, limiting speech, limiting the exchange of ideas. That is not healthy to a robust democracy. Well, I I thank you very much, uh, Congressman Rothfuss. Um, and again, as, uh, I'm, as I said to you, I'm, gonna, I'm going to put a link as well and share the, your, your paper. I mean, very, very insightful. I recommend everybody read it. It's, it's important. Print it out, share it. Um, and uh, this is how we are going to fix Congress. We're not going to change Congress. Uh, you know, just because you have a, re- a Republican majority doesn't mean it's fixed. Um, or just because you have a Democrat majority doesn't mean it's broken. Um, I think that uh, we, we start off by electing the right people and then we can fix Congress. Yeah, I think allow Democrats... Congress to work as, as the funders envisioned. Correct. Um, I, but you, you brought up a number of different points, tech, big tech and so on. I think that we'll have to have you back again for another conversation. We're going to take, we'll, we'll take these uh, piece by piece between now and November of 2022. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. And it was a, a, a great seeing you. Thank you.